Hello everybody, my name's Link, here to talk about the rest of the shows you can watch this spring 2021 anime season. As promised, here's the video where I quickly go over the other animes I've watched this season, and I try to keep it as spoiler-free as possible while I list out the things that could interest you in the show or not. I won't go into new seasons of previously running anime like the second career of Yuka no Moriarty, though you should really watch it. Video link in the description and the i button of my video for the first career if you need any more convincing. And the fifth season of My Hero Academia. Since I assume if you haven't watched the first four seasons, then there's nothing I can say to convince you otherwise. And as always, anything I say is purely based off the anime and how it's presented, not taking any of its source material into account. So let's get to it. In no particular order, let's start with Dragon Ieo Kao. Basically, free therapy. The anime based off a manga follows the story of an incredibly weak dragon named Letty, who can't breathe fire or even fly. As he's kicked out from his home after failing to basically do anything, we follow him on his search through forests to winter wonderlands, from apartments to share homes, to find his perfect forever home. Accompanied by one hell of a real estate agent, the elf Dearia. This show is gut-busting. Its skits and references to pop culture can just earn a straight-up guffaw out of me. As I watch this hopeless dragon get into trouble he miraculously gets out of, he may have abhorrent strength and speed stats, but I'm pretty sure he bought all of his stats in luck for him to last this long. And the other thing I love is that this series basically called Dragon Maid Sims cowards. Oh, you like dragons, you say? You're a dragon fucker, you say? Hmm, are you really? Because they will make you fall in love with this fully reptilian dragon. And yes, that means no boobas and his pathetic nature and you're gonna like it. The one thing I can say though is that Letty does get a bit annoying at points. Though that's only in part of his role as being the voice of reason. Because as he's often the source or center of the chaos that happens in the show, he also happens to be the straight man that points things out and sometimes I just find his quips unnecessary and would rather he just ride along with the jokes. That and sometimes his whining can get a bit too much. But he does eventually get his winning moments where you'll want to root for him again. So pros is that you get a stupid, hilarious, but also wholesome anime about a dragon finding his home with a mysterious and honestly sight for Sore Eyes Elf companion, as you find out more about the world through the eyes of the monster residents. Cons is that if you're not into slice of life or the mindless comedy, it might not be for you. And I also assume you don't have a soul. And there are times when the comedy won't hit and stick, but it often pays off with a wholesome scene. Moving along, we have Shakunetsu Kabari. And I gotta say, this anime took me all over the place. It's such a smart but also very basic sports anime. Based off a manga, the anime follows the main character Yoigoshi, a high schooler that sworn himself off of sports after he developed a hate for soccer and spent his after school life streaming. Hmm, timely. But of course, I'm not fooling any of you. We all know this adult is going to get dragged back into sports once again because this is a sports anime. And that sport in question is Kabaddi. A very aggressive game of tag. Before everything else, I really want to get it off my chest that the main character is so annoying. But in a good way. He's arrogant, disrespectful, antisocial, and a condensed can of toxic masculinity. Which is why it's so satisfying when you see him eat mad when he gets overconfident and fucks up. And the one thing he isn't though, is that he isn't averse to learning. He gets humbled a lot, and even just for the sake of winning, he learns to get over himself because he's a sore loser above everything I've listed about him. And it's a unique take to have the main protagonist to be the cynical and angry one to follow, instead of the bright-eyed novice. Not just for the chemistry it can brew up for his fellow cast members, but adds a certain sense of adrenaline and validation when this character, who was previously so against it, starts to feel the thrill and enjoyment of the sport. And I think making him insufferable in the beginning was just genius in keeping us entertained, while also a great landmark to show how much he's grown as a character. And while lacking the same depth the main character has, the supporting cast are all just fun high school dudes who like their sport but that doesn't define their entire personality. Of course, they don't lack in the kid that takes the sports way too seriously, especially next to the aforementioned sports-hating himbo that is Yoigoshi. But they're polished and well-rounded, especially the freaky captain. 
I am so weak to Gap Moe. And despite being so ridiculous, they still manage to make his presence on court something that demands your full attention because you know shit is going to go down. Otherwise, I appreciate the thought they put into not only showing how Kabaddi is also a strategy-rich game, but also explain it in detail to everyone so that we can marvel and know about Kabaddi as its own sport. If you're watching this in concern for the art style, don't worry, your resident eyes fit is here. You know I'll be the first one to nitpick at the slightest dissatisfaction I have with an anime's art. And while I admit Shakunetsu Kabaddi doesn't have the best sakuga for sports anime out there, it gets by and is consistent. Rarely does it ever drop in quality, and while it relies on a lot of still frames and some 3D dummies for their more action-oriented shots, the stills feel weighty as if you can feel the wind and the weight of their blows against one another. And yeah, there's no going around the 3D dummies though. Those are obviously just to save time, and hey, if one animator out there is better off because of it, I'll take it. So to round it off, Shekanatsu Kabadi is an incredibly fun and exciting show with entertaining premise and lovable cast. But it's also textbook sports anime and doesn't really bring anything new to the sports anime formula. It gives me the same vibe as Kuroko's Basket and Haikyuu despite being less produced. And as a fan of those two sports anime, I'm a firm believer that Shakunetsu Kabadi deserves to go as long as those two previous anime have as well. And just because I can, another sports anime back to back. Bakuten, also known as Backflip, is really exemplary on how many factors can really affect your viewing experience for a show. After the absolute disaster that was skate leading stars that seemed to just insist on doing everything wrong at every turn, and with this anime having the very same feeling via its PVs of a generic looking cast of boys doing a sport that's usually done in solo but now in group form, and the PV just so happens to have the best of their animation. So I honestly wasn't looking at this show until I had to make this video. And that is because of an anime it had no connection to whatsoever. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. What is Bakuten? This anime original follows the professional benchwarmer Futaba Shotaro as he goes through his entire middle school life not once able to play in an official game. On his way home from his last game in middle school, he goes to watch a rhythmic gymnastics competition on a whim. Being taken by the Shoshukan High School's rhythmic gymnastics club's performance and being inspired to join them, then follows his story of slowly learning the skills and techniques of gymnastics with his supportive senpais. Having Shakonetsu Kabaddi and Bakatat in the same season really gives my observations some solid form. I've noticed in the past years that there's been two types of sports anime. One that embraces the traditional mold and focuses on the adrenaline-pumping thrills of the sports itself, and the other type focuses more on the characters and their personal as well interpersonal growth as they go through the sports in question as the common medium. And you can already guess what Bakatan falls under, right? I have no qualms with this type of storytelling, just that I do find it a bit slow. Something that isn't inherently bad when you fill the spaces in between with meaningful content no matter how still or silent it may be. And the anime does have a great way of stringing you along with some mindless fun with the promise of something going on. But outside of the training bits to get the main character up to speed with the rest of the team, as well as getting to know their rivals, a lot of the scenarios feel kinda useless to be there. Not useless in that you can't gain any entertainment out of it, just that it felt like it contributed little to the progression of the plot. Until we hit the big payoff that is their first ever performance as a team that's just about halfway down the series. Which, I'll repeat, is something I don't find necessarily bad. Just that it's not for me. People who enjoy slice of life and character driven shows will probably love this anime. Because it delves more into the emotional aspects of the characters as we relate to their problems that are grounded in reality. And thus feel more of a connection to them. The thing is, it's just not my go-to genre. If I had nothing else and it plays, then I'll watch it and enjoy it. But I do prefer my sports shows more exciting and filled with action. Other things that stuck out to me is that the two main protagonists are really… bland. Futaba is every awkward kid ever who's only trying his best. Meanwhile, I feel like they didn't really try with the obligatory genius of the team for this one. I enjoy watching the captain more than anything, and I guess that is just more of a statement to me loving wild and high energy over the calmer and subdued energies. Otherwise, the show is just solid for all of the above mentioned reasons, and is rooted in a formula that works, but doesn't really do anything above and beyond to give it a head above the rest. 
Moving away from the happy and lighthearted shows for a bit is our next anime, Dora, the Princess of Snow and Blood. The first impression I got from episode 1 was, what if Kingsman, but in ancient and also dystopian steampunk Japan, with gothic magical girls? And if that sounds interesting to you, well I thought so too. This anime original is about Yukimurasawa, whose entire village was murdered by the mysterious gentleman. Now living undercover as a bookstore owner, she works for Nue, a secret organization working under the government with the promise to gain more about Genome and get her revenge. First things first, I had really big hopes for this one. While admittedly I had my doubts at first, the climax for episode 1 gave me hope that maybe this show has something special. The aesthetics were sublime. Her form when she merges with the crow got my full attention. Like it's so simple but also majestic and I've never seen the effect her blue breath flame has. Where if it overlaps with her face, you can see her skull. That is absolutely metal. I just thought that if they managed to come up with that, then surely there are some cool ideas inbound, right? Come next few episodes, I was devastatingly bored. If you've noticed how absolutely barren the summary I gave is, then congratulations, you've pretty much guessed the experience you'll have for this entire show. Don't get me wrong, I fully understand that the show is striving to go for a serious and heavy tone, and I've said it multiple times here on my channel that a show following an already established formula can be amazing. No one has to be the next Death Note or Full Metal Alchemist with how they tackle difficult topics or interesting setups. So I'm not critiquing it for using an overused plot of someone seeking revenge for the massacre of their entire village. I'm criticizing it for its lack of inspiration and drive to be anything above the revenge plot. The most creative they were was with the main character and her unique power, because everything from the rest of her character, to the backup cast, to the main plot, was really uninspired. I wouldn't have minded if they used the revenge shoot as a skeleton for their story, but they literally just took it and ran, not bothering to add their own spin to it. You know it's bad when the first time I saw a certain character, I already knew their twist, without knowing it was supposed to be a twist. They literally had a walking plot twist so obvious I didn't even know it was supposed to be a secret. I think the problem lies in the fact that they take themselves too seriously. They presented themselves as so edgy and monochrome that it sucked any fun out of it. I reckon that the good amount of the shows that use a common trope are aware that it is a trope, and just play around that. And just because it's a serious anime doesn't mean it can't have its fun moments to break away from the depression and show a lighter side to give you some sense of joy. The next anime in the list had it, one of the most edgy anime has it, so there's no reason this one can't, aside from the fact that it doesn't want to get out of its own head. I'm not saying this show is unwatchable, I'm just saying I didn't enjoy it. But I'm sure there's an audience out there for it. At the end of the day, the anime delivers the story it wants to tell, and it might not have disagreed to my taste in entertainment. Joran is like a tightrope, it'll sway from time to time, but will eventually straighten itself up and reach the other end of the rope. How many times they have to sway to get there, to the point you wonder if you actually find this journey to the other side enjoyable enough, is completely up to you. Moving on to the next dark and gritty show, Marsh Red was something that intrigued me due to the art style since it has the same artist as Dorote Niwarao and a premise that I'm incredibly weak to. Adapted from a manga, Marsh Red takes place in a Taisho era Japan where vampires are proving to be an unexpected problem, so they created the special unit Code Zero that specializes in hunting down rogue vampires with their own cultivated vampires, but with little success. With illegal blood trades and the pressure of this unit threatened to be shut down, enters Colonel Yoshinobu Maeda, their seemingly last ray of hope. But what lurks in the shadow is not all that they may seem. First off, I'd love to gush about the setting so much. There's something about this era of Japan that's just a treat for my eyes. Like there's something so interesting about seeing the middle of an era change as the buildings and people move on to a more modern style but it's still mixed in with a fair amount of the traditional culture. It's something I love about Demon Slayer too, with Tanjiro and the rest wearing a traditional haori over their more minimalistic and western-inspired gakorans. And I feel that that transition is the key component to not only the aesthetics, but also the story structure as well. A conflict between the old and the new, the pros and cons of adapting to a new way of life, and that sometimes, the necessity of change. From the steadfast military needing to learn to implement a whole new tactic to deal with the threat they haven't encountered before, in which I appreciate them showing how fatal 
new operations against a deadly unknown can be. To the more mundane and personal changes, the new vampires of Code Zero have to adjust to as now immortal beings of the night. And while this is also serious and bleak, it is an offer to have a little fun, even if it's to use a certain comic relief character, even if he only fits that role in the loosest form of the word. But already, just that little inclusion made it more bearable than Joram. One glaring issue for me that prevents me from fully enjoying the show though, is that it uses TOO much words. They just drop a whole lot of literature references like that's supposed to explain what the hell is going on, rather than just draw parallels to how their own situation is going. And they use it a lot. And as you may or may not know, your girl is Jared. I can't read. So I have no idea where these lines are coming from and what they're supposed to mean. I would argue that if they used the more simplified translations of the words, I'd maybe get what they're meaning to say. But no! We're going full on thou shall shan't shart thee these motherfuckers. And I just chewed out. And that for me is really its biggest weakness, as its reliance of the poetic phrases makes it hard for me to understand what the fuck is going on. And I wish they just portray what they mean with the animation instead. And the other thing is that there seems to be inconsistencies with their main vampire character, Kurisu. Like at first they showed him hesitating to end the life of a vampire, so I thought okay, he's gonna be one of those who learns the hard way how to kill with his own two hands for the sake of the greater good. And I don't know if it happened off screen or something, but the next time we see him use his sword, he's just mauling down the vampires without batting an eye. So I was wondering, which is it? Is he a bleeding heart who can't draw others' blood? Or is he a trained soldier who's numbed himself for the sake of his duty? Otherwise, I think Mars Red is a solid. It has a high concept grounded in somewhat reality for their intriguing cast to move around in. And as long as you aren't overtly offended with lots of deep words, you're golden to give this rustic vampire show a try. On to our last and definitely not least show of the season, Mashiro no Oto. I'll be honest, I only checked this one out because I love the sound of traditional string instruments, and I just hope for cool OSTs. I won't pretend I'm even the slightest bit knowledgeable about the intricacies and practices of these traditional instruments, but all I know is that they sound good in my ear holes and so I like it. Adapted from a manga, this story centers around Sawa Murasetsu, who has admired the beautiful and eccentric music his grandfather created his entire life, and now that he has passed, Setsu felt as if he's lost his sound along with him. He decided to go to the loud and bustling Tokyo in hopes of rediscovering his sound, and along the way discovering more about himself than just the tunes he plays. This anime really didn't go the direction I thought it would. <laughs> I first saw this anime with this picture and didn't know it got changed sometime along the way. So I was really psyched for this to be a slice of life self-discovery of an adult who's been isolated all his life and just now seeing the world beyond the musical horizon. And the first episode as well as the first quarter of episode 2 really had me convinced, as well as the slight trinkle of how an artist can survive in this world while still pursuing his art. But nope, it got turned into a school setting, and the worst thing Setsu has to deal with is how to socialize. I've never hidden my dislike for school settings. Of course I watch them because there's really no way to escape them, but unlike shows similar to Assassination Classroom that molds its premise around the school setting and thus making it an irreplaceable part of it, I wish premises like these had more wiggle room to go around more places and to meet more people than be confined behind the walls of the school. As well as add to the fact that they're trying to add some high school romance bullshit and I really did not care for it. I just wanted to see the next performance and with whom it was with. I really didn't ask to see this much blushing on my screen. But I do find it funny that there had to be someone pulling the strings to get things to where they need to be and it felt like the series is aware of its limitations. So it feels like a self-aware jab at itself. While I didn't want the extra serving of high school romance, I definitely got what I came for in the beautiful and soul shaggy shamisen performances the show has. Have you ever had an anime where they try to tell you how amazing something is, and sure for the sake of enjoying the show you believe it, but by the end, it didn't really leave an impact on you? That is the complete opposite of my experience with Mashiro no Oto. Even if my fingers can't play a single instrument, the show has completely conveyed to me the skill and talent it takes to create such beautiful sounds. And while I can't really see what they mean with their comparisons to season and nature, 
Every strum and chord they play does resonate with me to translate every turmoil or any other emotion that they're expressing with their strings. And by far, my favorite performance was episode 2's Sagaro Horabushi. Nothing has commanded my attention more than that single piece that I can just feel goosebumps forming on my arms as I recall it. The sound director and whoever they had to play the songs need an award. And I'm very fond of the mixture of modern and traditional things as you've heard in my Mars Red section. So their opening, that was a mix of that intense shamisen strings with the pop rock as well as the unique register of Burnout Syndrome singer, just made their opening an absolute treat. So to close it off, I just wish there was more to Mashiro no Oto. I feel like it could have gone a lot of ways, but setting it in a school while still managing to leave away more of the protagonist's growth put a limiter on how far they could have really gone. And if you've been eyeing the series because you enjoy the traditional music genre of this type, then it's an absolute must-watch for you. And that's it for this one, everybody. Thank you if you made it to the end of the video. If an anime you were looking for isn't in this video, then check out this playlist of my other videos on Spring 2021 anime. And while you're at it, why not also take a peek at this playlist to see my other series where I review and recommend anime you might not have heard of. Are they hidden gems or do they deserve to fall into obscurity? Let's find out together. And as always, don't forget to leave a thumbs up if you liked the video and consider subscribing for all things Weeban anime. Bye bye! See you in the next one!